I bring you greetings from the other Calvary Baptist Church, thousands of miles from Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is our second trip here. We were here uh, 2015 or so at the invitation of the Wesleys, our good friends uh, who come over as a partnership mission with us. And it's been a very, very fruitful ministry. Uh, catalyzing our church into evangelism and doing all kinds of things for the church and the kingdom of God. Uh, as Dr. Graham said, thank you for this invitation. I recently retired from ministry in Calvary Baptist Church, retired but not tired. <laughs> of course, I've been there for, I mean, since 1991, serving as a senior pastor. So it's our time to hand over to some new ones and see what else the Lord would like us to do. We're here essentially for a month, spend time with family and friends, and surely the family and friends include those in Little Rock, Arkansas, mm -hmm. and the church named Calvary and other friends as well. We thank God for the great things he's doing in our midst. We all believe these are the last days, so every opportunity we have, we just use it to glorify God and share his word. So thank you again for the privilege of reading his word. The word to read today is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, from verse 1 to 13. I don't know what the pleasure of the house is. Do we stand when we read or we sit? Or? Sure. Let's stand in honor of the word of God. Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit gave them, as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one of them heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans, then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have drunk too much wine. Let us pray. Lord, we know when your spirit visits us, there are many reactions. But today we are gathered in Calvary. Calvary in Ghana, Calvary in Little Rock. In accordance, in obedience to your word, that says where two or three, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in their midst. So thank you for the people gathered here. Thank you for your servants. Thank you for Dr. Jackson and the team as they bring us your word. May your word touch us, heal us, direct us, correct us, but above all, give us that boldness to be witnesses for you as happened when your Holy Spirit came on your people on the day of Pentecost. To you alone be glory, praise, and honor, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Deeby. Well, I want you to look in your Bibles at the passage that uh, Fred just read for us, Acts chapter 2. 
What a day it was. The day of Pentecost, the day when the promised gift arrived. What I want us to do is just kind of unpack this passage and then we'll talk about Peter's sermon that followed uh, this introduction to the Pentecost event. But first of all, let's just kind of get, get a kind of a framework for the passage. Pentecost, the word pente means five, and so it's five or some derivative of five. It means 50, uh, and it, it was 50 days after the Passover. And so this was another one of the major Jewish festivals that they celebrated about a month and a half after the Passover took place. And it was one of the festivals that we call a pilgrimage festival. And all of the Jews that lived within range were supposed to travel to Jerusalem for this celebration. Pentecost was a harvest festival. Sometimes it's referred to as the first fruits festival, where they were uh, taking an in gathering of the first part of the harvest. And so it was really like our Thanksgiving. Our Thanksgiving is a harvest festival, but it comes at the end of the harvest. Theirs came at the beginning. And so they were celebrating God's provision for them, his people. But also at the time of, of, of this writing in the New Testament world, Pentecost also was a celebration of God's giving of the law, the law of Moses, the old covenant law at Mount Sinai. And again, that happened about 50 days after the Passover event. Remember, the Passover was the last plague in Egypt, and uh, Pharaoh changed his no to go, and he let the Israelites leave Egypt, and they began to travel through the wilderness and the desert to the promised land. And along the way, they come to Mount Sinai, and it was there at Mount Sinai when God granted them the law about 50 days after the Passover. And so this was a festival celebrating God's provision, his harvest, but also a festival celebrating the Old Testament Mosaic law. And I think these two things come into play in terms of the timing, why God chose for this very special celebration, this festival called Pentecost, to also be the birthday of the church when he sent the promised gift, the gift of, of the Holy Spirit. Now, just kind of the backstory, think about what's going on. Remember, Jesus Christ has already come. He's lived the perfect life among us, and then he died the sacrificial death for us on the cross. So he's paid the price for our sins. After he died, we know he was buried, and he was in a tomb three days, and on the third day, he rose from the dead, proving that he could conquer death and had conquered death, could deliver on his promise to give life to his followers. And then we find out that he had all these resurrection appearances. Forty days he was among the people. And all of the disciples saw him alive, especially Peter, who we're going to read about and see takes a leading role in this passage at Pentecost in just a moment. They all saw him alive. They were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Not only them, but over 500 people saw him on one occasion. So we have these resurrection appearances. And then in Acts chapter 1, we see that Jesus then gathers with his, his believers, about 120 in all, gathered on the Mount of Olives, which was just across the Kidron Valley. Uh, the Mount of Olives would have been uh, looking at the Temple Mount. And he gathered with his followers there, and Jesus basically said that you will receive power when the gift comes, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and uh, so you need to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the gift. And then in Acts 1-8, we have those famous words where Jesus basically tells the church, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that's right where they were. Throughout Judea, that was the province that Jerusalem was part of. And into Samaria, the next and neighboring province, and then to the ends of the earth. And so that's what happens. The believers go back. They go back to Jerusalem, and they're waiting. 
And we find out that they gather in an upper room, very likely the same upper room where Jesus had gathered with his disciples some 50 days earlier and instituted the Lord's Supper. And so they gathered in the upper room. While they waited, they prayed, we're told, in Acts 1. And they were led to find a replacement for Judas Iscariot, the disciple who had betrayed Jesus and subsequently had committed suicide. So they replaced Judas, and the Lord led them to a man named Matthias, who became the twelfth disciple now, one that was also an eyewitness of Jesus. And they were waiting now for the gift. And then in Acts 2, the passage that Dr. Digby read for us, we see that the gift arrives at Pentecost. And when it came, it came with a splash. He came with a splash. Verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. So wind is often associated with the Holy Spirit. We know the word spirit in the New Testament means pneuma, and sometimes it's actually even translated as wind or breath. And so we see this connection to wind. This was a very violent, forceful wind that uh, was part of the experience. And then we also see in the Old Testament a lot of associations with fire, and the holiness of God, or our holy God. You might even think back to Moses. Remember when he received his calling at the burning bush. The bush was on fire, and then from the bush he heard God speak, saying, Moses, take off your shoes, you're now on holy ground. So fire is associated with God and holiness. We see when the Israelites are in the desert, traveling to the promised land, They have that Shekinah glory of God guiding them, and it was a pillar of fire by night. No doubt the presence of the Holy Spirit was in that pillar of fire, leading God's people in the direction that they should go. When they get to Mount Sinai, what was happening when they they received that law that they were celebrating at Pentecost, when they received that law, the mountain itself was on fire. And they were told that God is like a consuming fire. So these are very, uh, these connections with wind and fire are very biblical and would have resonated with these stories and who God was and is. And so these were happening. And then verse 4 says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In other words, they were given the ability to speak a language they had not yet learned, a foreign language. And we're going to see in just a moment the reason they were given this is so they could share the gospel with foreigners that were there, foreign Jews. Remember, they had traveled in from all over the world. Jews had traveled in. We had 15 different nationalities that were mentioned in this passage starting in verse 9. But we know it wasn't an exhaustive list. It was a representative list because it already said that people from every nation were there. All of these different nations and nationalities were suddenly hearing these Galileans. Most of the early believers were Galileans speaking the gospel in their native language. And they could understand them clearly. And they could understand their message clearly. It was an amazing thing that was happening. And so they began to share the gospel and speak of the wonders of God. And we see, if you just remember all these and look back at all of the words describing their response. In verse 6, they were bewildered. In verse 7, they were utterly amazed. We look down at verse 12, they were amazed and perplexed. And they asked one another, what does this mean? Something Radical was happening. Something very strange and unusual was happening. They knew it was significant. What does this mean? One theologian says, they, some mused, that means they were thinking deeply about what was happening, trying to figure it out. Some mused. Others mocked. And then some were moved. 
Some mused, others mocked, and some were moved by what was happening. Verse 13 is talking about those who mocked them. It says, some, however, made fun of them, saying they have had too much wine. Now, there's actually a connection, a biblical connection, to being filled with the Spirit and being filled with wine. And what's the connection? What's the comparison? It's actually a comparison and a contrast. You might remember in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul tells the Ephesian believers, do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, meaning bad things, but instead be filled with the Spirit, which implies it's going to lead to very good things, very righteous things. But the connection really is about how Wine, when somebody gets completely intoxicated with wine, it takes over, the alcohol takes over their bodies and their being and their thinking, all of them. Some of you might remember, um, some of you know Rick and Gay Atkinson. Rick's a good friend of mine, and Rick told me the story one time when he got out of bed one morning. This is when They lived over kind of in Pleasant Valley, just right off a Rolling Road. He said he got out of bed one morning, and he went into his living room, only to discover that there was a man, a strange man, sleeping on his couch. And so he awakened the man, and he said, what are you doing in my house, sleeping on my couch? And the man kind of came to his senses and was very apologetic. And he said, well, I thought it was my house and my couch. And so they then began kind of a process of trying to figure out why this man was so confused. They ultimately went outside looking for his car. And there was no car in sight. Looked everywhere. They could not find his car. And so finally, Rick took the man home. And the man lived on the other side of Little Rock in a completely different neighborhood. Later that day, they began to hear stories from neighbors and other things that a car, an abandoned car, had been found blocks away from the Atkinson home and that several mailboxes had been run over and the car was inoperable. And the man had no clue, no clue, no memory of that experience whatsoever. He was completely under the control and the possession of the alcohol. It had taken over his body and his mind and his memory, everything. Well, when the spirit, if we contrast that to the spirit, that's debauchery. This is the good thing that comes. When the spirit takes over us, he takes control of us in the same way, but it's always good and fruitful. And the righteousness comes. And so that's why they were saying, we believe, they had too much wine. They had been under the control of something, something weird, something strange was taking over. And so Peter stands up now, verse 14, and he addresses the crowd. And he's going to explain what's actually taking place. And then he's going to leverage that into a gospel presentation and appeal for these people to be saved, to hear the gospel, to believe in this Jesus of the gospel, to repent of their sins, and to get saved, and then they too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's where this is all going. So Peter stands up, and he begins to raise his voice and speak to the crowd. He says, fellow Jews, verse 14, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he says it's too early for these people to be drunk. Obviously, they had a very important value in their culture that you would not drink in the morning. It was taboo. He said this this is not something, they're not drunk. What is happening is a fulfillment of the prophet Joel. Joel had actually prophesied 850 years before the New Testament era, before this event. An ancient prophecy And so then Peter quotes the prophecy. In verse 17, he says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. And you remember, we've even talked about this in some of the other prophecies. Remember Jeremiah 
31, Jeremiah had said God's going to send a new covenant. It's going to be a new day. And he's not going to write this covenant on stone tablets like he did the Ten Commandments. He's going to write it on the hearts of men. And then with that, remember Ezekiel 36, we looked at that as well. Ezekiel talks about the same new day, the same new era, and he says it'll be an era of the Spirit, a time of the Spirit when this new covenant is going to be given. And so now Peter is connecting these prophecies even back to Joel, who is saying the same thing. There'll be a day and the last day when God's going to pour out his Spirit on the people. That's what's happening It's come, it's a new day, a new era, a new time. And it's all gonna be a time of the Spirit. You know, last days, when Scripture talks about last days, really, it really began when Jesus left this earth. They began to live in the last days, and of course, we are still living in the last days. And it's still an era of the Spirit. A time of the Spirit, the day of the Spirit. Look what he says here is the result. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. One of the commentators I read said that if you're living in the Spirit, when the the day of the Spirit comes, You cannot be and will not be racist, sexist, ageist, or elitist. What did he mean by that? Well, you cannot be racist. The Spirit is poured out on God's people, on all people, all nations. All are included. This is never a time, there can never be a time in the Spirit where God's people will divide or be prejudiced, or segregated. It's a time of unity in terms of race, and culture, and people groups. You cannot be sexist. This is for your sons, verse 17 says, the sons and daughters will prophesy. And your men, verse 18, and your men and women, he will pour out his spirit upon. It's not a time to be ageist. He says in verse 17, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Very intergenerational. The Spirit's very intergenerational. It's not a time to be elitist. He says, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit. There's no class distinctions Class divisions, social classes, none of that. We're all one in Christ. That's why Paul talks about this in Christ. And if you remember Galatians 3.28, he says, In Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. We are one in Christ. That's because of the Spirit. And we continue to read things like in Ephesians 4, verses 3 through 6, he says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit, Through the bond of peace, we need to live in unity because of the Spirit, because we're in a day of the Spirit. And he says, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope. And then he says in verse 5, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This is a time where the church must stand. If we're living in the Spirit under the the empowerment of the Spirit, in the day of the Spirit, we will be unified and we will model unity throughout the world, throughout our relationships, throughout lives, throughout our church and how we treat one another and welcome everyone. It's an age of unity. And then he says in verse 19 and 20, he's going to have all kinds of of supernatural events are going to happen on the earth, wonders Signs and wonders will happen in the heavens above and on the earth below. But I love what it says at the end, verse 21, the end of Joel's prophecy. It says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It will be a time, a day, a day of the Spirit is a time when the gospel is boldly proclaimed through the power of the Spirit and people's lives are changed forever, for eternity. 
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a day it is. And then he goes on to preach the gospel. He piggybacks off of Joel's prophecy. This is Peter. And by the way, this is a new and improved Peter, right? This is not the the Peter we meet in the gospels who's often more of a stumbling, bumbling, fumbling, put your foot in your mouth type Peter, right? This is a very different Peter. He's bold, he's confident, he's clear, he's effective, he has a power speaking through him, a boldness. Where's that coming from? It's coming from the Holy Spirit. And so Peter is preaching boldly. He then goes on, you'll see here uh, in verses 25 and through 28, he begins a, to, to quote another Old Testament prophecy spoken by David in Psalm 16. And it's really just sharing this to point to Jesus' resurrection. And in verse 29, he says, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on earth that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay, because God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this. And now, verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured out on you what you now see and hear. So he's sharing the gospel. Jesus came to this earth, Son of God, died that sacrificial death, but did not stay dead. He rose from the dead, and we saw it. We were eyewitnesses, Peter says. And then we also saw him exalted. He ascended to heaven. Acts 1, they saw him go up into the clouds, where he now is at the right hand of God, exalted, ruling and reigning and waiting for the day when the Father says it's time to come back. So Peter's sharing the gospel. And as he shares the gospel... We began to see an appeal to a decision upon the people listening. Remember, these were crowds. They had gone from the house, no doubt, to the Temple Mount, and there were probably 200,000 Jews, we estimate, that were there at that time celebrating the Pentecost festival. And so Peter's preaching out there in the courtyards, this open-air preaching, and he gets to this point where he's talking about Jesus, and he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. He's the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. He's Lord of all. And when the people heard this, verse 37 says, they were cut to the heart. That means they came under deep conviction. Their hearts were broken because of their sin and what they had done and how they had even contributed and allowed their leaders to put Jesus to death. They were heartbroken. They were cut to the heart, it says. And they responded by saying, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter basically says this, you got to repent, turn from your sins, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like all of us have received The gift of the Spirit, he's saying. And then this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for whom all whom the Lord our God will call. It's not just for you. It's for your children and their children. For all who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those, listen to this, those who accepted his message were baptized. Listen to how many were baptized, how many accepted the message, heard the gospel and responded. It says about 3,000 were added to their number that day. A Pentecost revival had broken out. And that's what happens when we live in an era of the Spirit, when we allow the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives, of our church, of our thoughts, our minds, our hands, our feet, 
We become the hands and feet of Christ. We become the voice of Christ, boldly speaking truth, witnessing to those who are not yet part of us. We have the mind of Christ. We're empowered by Christ. He leads us, directs us, even uses us in miraculous ways. Why? Because it's a day of the Spirit. And when we're living in the Spirit, these are not unexpected or unusual things. These are normal things or should become normal things. You read the book of Acts, that's what happens. The time of the Spirit, the day of the Spirit, is a day of regeneration because that's what the Spirit does. We become born again. People become born again spiritually through the Spirit. We get saved through the Spirit. And then he comes to live not just with us but within us and begins the sanctifying work. What does that mean? He's making us like Christ, making us holy. The Holy Spirit makes us holy day by day. We're being sanctified. And that process is continuing how? Through the Holy Spirit. He then gives us this oneness in Christ with each other. He gives us a new mission that he will empower us for. He gives us a new church family, the family of God. He gives us gifts that we need to do the work that he's called us to. We call them spiritual gifts, gifts given by the Holy Spirit. And he gives us the power and the direction to do those gifts. He directs us to the very specific plans he has for each one of us to accomplish. All through the Spirit. The day of the Spirit. What a day it was and what a day it is. I want you to join me in praying that our church will be a church full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, accomplishing the work of the Holy Spirit. And if that prayer is answered, I believe we'll see similar things happening in our church, our lives, just like we see in the book of Acts, the acts of the Holy Spirit of God. Please join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible passage, description of these dramatic events when your spirit first came and fell upon your people and the church was born. Father, may we be like the first century church, but only in the 21st century. May we be it right here, Calvary Baptist Church, Little Rock, and may it flow from us into the rest of our city, into the state of Arkansas, throughout the United States, and then into the world, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus and offering the greatest of gifts, the gifts of salvation and the gift of the Spirit to all who will believe and receive. May we be that type of church and we'll do it in your name for your glory. And it's in your name that we pray, the name of Jesus, amen.